Well, thanks, uh, Janil, for that introduction and very warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for having me here this morning to join you at this third Community Leaders Conference. As I cast my eyes around and on the way in, I've seen some familiar faces. Uh, some of you have been active on the ground within the community groups, religious organizations as well. And I see some brothers from the union as well joining in this discussion. So thank you for inviting me to this, to be, or to be at this part of a very important discussion today as we talk about the topic of diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Now, race and religious harmony have been fundamental to Singapore's identity since the very beginning of our nation. We are a multiracial, multi-religious, multicultural country. But as you would all know from our history, that this harmony does not come naturally and we do need to make efforts to continue to build trust and acceptance between different races, different community groups, and importantly, to protect these common spaces that we've built. If you look back at our history, you know in the beginning of our nationhood, racial riots were common. And it took us many generations to be where we are today, where we can actually sit down and openly talk about topics like this. As pointed out by Minister Lawrence Wong at the IPS RSIS Forum on Race and Racism last June, Singapore did not set out the beginning as a nation to achieve racial harmony by creating a monolithic society. We're not a nation of one race alone. Our multi-racism also does not require any community to give up its heritage or traditions. And today we celebrate each other's festivals. Many of you in the community will know we invite each other for our different religious festivals and our community and traditional events. Singapore's system has worked because of the mutual understanding and trust that are forged between our different communities. It takes effort on all parties. Be it at work or in play, we must not waver in our commitment to promote harmony among all races and ensure that all Singaporeans enjoy full and equal opportunities in life. I think that's something that we all aspire to do and we should continue to work hard at this. Racial and religious harmony is vital for Singapore's social cohesion. This statement, I'm sure everyone here will strongly agree. And we do not tolerate any form of racial or religious discrimination because it sows discords amongst and between community groups and threatens the harmony that we hold so dear and work so hard over many generations to build up. We want the bonds that bind our different communities together to continue growing from strength to strength. So this year's conference, themed Keeping Harmony at Work, is a very useful and important conference for us to talk about how we bring some of these ideas of religious and racial harmony into our workspaces. Now, fundamentally, we must believe that everyone deserves a fair opportunity to contribute and thrive at work. Building a diverse and inclusive workforce is also key to ensuring Singapore's economic vitality so that businesses can access the manpower that it needs for their growth and our people can take on good job opportunities. To help Singaporeans build the relevant skill sets to seize these opportunities, we invest heavily in Singapore's, Singaporeans in many ways. So for example, the SG United Jobs and Skills Package provides jobs training, training ships, training, upgrading, upskilling, attachments for job seekers and workers alike for them to gain industry-relevant skills and experience so they can become more employable and are sought after by the industry. WSG's career conversion programs helps mid-career job seekers who want to enter new job spaces, new job roles, to be able to access those more exciting career opportunities. And during the COVID crisis, we rolled out the Jobs Growth Incentive to incentivize employers to continue hiring people. And as we emerge from this COVID crisis, the Jobs Growth Incentive has shifted its focus to be more targeted towards a vulnerable segment of job seekers, those who are mature above the age of 40, those who may be ex-offenders, and those who may have disabilities. So through all these different measures, we want to make sure that Singaporeans of different abilities continue to be able to have a fair shot at seeking good job opportunities. At the same time, we also want to strengthen workplace fairness to ensure that our workers are treated fairly at the workplace. Now, over two decades of education, 
coupled with enforcement, we have seen standards of workplace fairness improve over time. In March, I shared the latest findings from MOM's Fair Employment Practice Survey at the dialogue organised by REACH. It showed that there was significant decline in resident job applicants who experienced discrimination during their job search from 43% in 2018 to about 25% in 2021. So that kind of uh, discrimination by job seekers has shown improvement and dropped by about half over the last three years. The survey also showed that 8% of resident workforce had experienced some workplace discrimination in the past year. So clearly, more can be done to tackle the incidences of discrimination at the workplace happening today. But I must also say here that workplace discrimination or perceptions of workplace discrimination is not unique to Singapore. A survey in UK done in 2021 showed that 36% of job seekers in UK experienced some form or perceived that they have experienced some form of discrimination. One in 10 in the UK felt the discrimination of age and one in 20, about 5.3% or so, felt discrimination on the basis of gender. So this is a problem that is uh, happening in many places, and I'm not sure the work on this front will ever end. It will be something that we all have to continue to work together. Each generation building that compact, each generation building an understanding, trust and knowledge to be able to take this forward and expand that common space. Now, between 2014 and the second half, sorry, and the first half of 2021, the Tripartite Alliance for Fair and Employment Practices, TAFEP, received an average of 379 workplace discrimination complaints each year. So, among all the complaints, nationality, age, and gender form the most common grounds for discrimination in Singapore. Fortunately, discrimination on grounds of disability as well as race and religion were less common. Now, while reported cases of discrimination on grounds of race and religion are less common, in our multiracial, multicultural, multireligious society, one case is one case too many. That could be that one case that triggers off very emotive responses from different groups. Dr. Matthews shared in his presentation this morning that minorities continue to feel that they are treated differently at the workplace. There are also racial preferences when it comes to employment, including those who we are open to hire. So there is that sense of very negative discrimination against someone. There's also the sense that there is positive discrimination for someone. So it is something that is in our attitude that we have to discuss and perhaps find a way to address that. There is a need to put in place a strong and robust system to uphold fairness at the workplace and address anxieties that might emerge in the longer term. Now, at the National Day rally last year, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong announced that we will enshrine the tripartite guidelines for fair employment practices in law. This is a significant move, and it sends a strong signal that Singapore does not tolerate any form of workplace discrimination. As you heard, the Tripartite Committee on Workplace Fairness is busy at work. This committee is co-chaired by Minister for Manpower, Dr Tan Si Leng, the President of Singapore National Employers Federation, Dr. Robert Yap, and the SEC Gen of NTUC, Mr. Ng Chi Meng. They are deliberating on the scope and the design of the legislation and are consulting widely among all the stakeholders seeking views from different segments of society. Now, while legislation can give us more teeth to tackle some of these uh, problems and perhaps deal with the egregious ones, I must also caution that it is not a panacea. It cannot solve all problems. We want to avoid creating, in the process of creating legislation, we want to avoid creating a litigious environment in the workplace. So we want to strike that balance between ensuring discrimination is looked upon in a, in a, in a very negative way by the rest of society and everyone takes the same stand against zero tolerance to discrimination, but yet at the same time, we don't want legislation to end up creating litigious workplace environments. So the tripartite partners will have their work cut out for us to try and strike some of these balances. We will need to continue to engage and prioritise educating employers, engaging our employers to shape the right mindsets and practices and to resolving reported cases through mediation as far as possible. Use mediation as a platform for educating and help people be more aware and 
you know, be more conscious about what actually constitutes discrimination. And that approach, we believe, would not allow us to then take litigation or the law as the first, talk, first part of call for any uh, issues that are encountered on the ground. The committee will have to balance across different issues, interests and suggestions that will be raised and surfaced during our engagements and with our stakeholders. So today, your views and your feedback will be useful in helping us to address uh, some of these recommendations that Singaporeans hope to see. And we hope the recommendations will benefit Singapore and Singaporeans for the long term. So on this note, I thank you once again for having me here and I look forward to a lively discussion with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ko. We have now come to the dialogue session with our guest of honor, moderated by Dr. Matthew. Before we begin, a gentle reminder to approach the standing microphones and identify yourself and your organization first before asking your questions. Dr. Matthew, please. Thank you, SMS, for the very, very helpful uh, introduction of some of your thoughts. Uh, you highlighted the fact that there's a mutual history that we have of understanding the workplace, and that needs to continue. And I think the, it's, it's very good to know some of the things that the government has been doing in terms of trying to think about or consult about legislation. I think this is a great time for everyone to put some of your questions and uh, all your thoughts. I think SMS, as you mentioned, is also open to ideas or feedback or thoughts about uh, what would be the different considerations and things as the government seeks and the committee thinks about uh, legislation on the issues to do with workplace fairness. So I, the mics are open there and make sure that it's ready. Uh, make sure that you tell us your name and also the organization you come from. And if, if you can, there are many, many issues to do with uh, uh, race and religion today. So, but today we want to focus on workplace issues. So if I can get you to focus on workplace matters, so that number one. Number two, uh, since this is something that we've been dealing with, particularly about race and religion, now there are many areas of discrimination, age and disability and sexuality, gender. But again, if I can just get you today to focus your questions a little bit more about the broader issues about uh, discrimination, workplace fairness, when it comes to the, the diversity issues about uh, race and religion, that would be a lot of help so that we can focus this discussion today and make it very productive. All right, I, I see some people there. I'll take this, there's one question. Anybody else? We're going to try to take a number of questions today. So anybody else have a question? If you can just get to the mic. Yes, sir, there. Anybody? I just want to take two or three questions, and then I think we'll be able to, to get some good discussion. Okay, we have two questions, and... Uh, We'll get that started. Yeah, over to you first. Uh, good morning, uh, SMS, uh, SMOS, and as well as uh, Dr. Matthew. Thank you so much for a wonderful um, session this morning. It's the first time attending this. I heard that it's reunion for many people here, and we're glad to be back. Um, SMOS, I'm glad that you say that one case is one too many. Just as in discrimination, in ageism, we see that in a lot of countries, but in Singapore, we have a rapidly aging society. We cannot afford to see that. I think if we see a case of discrimination on the basis of race and religion, there is even bigger impact. So I want to draw, uh, sorry, this is Yen from Women Empowered for Work and Margarine. Uh, I focus on work-life harmony. I just want to draw the, on the, um, you know, what have been done in the area of work-life harmony. Uh, the work started in early 2000s. We've taken almost two decades, and in the last two years, what we couldn't do in two decades we managed to do a lot of things in work life harmony. But I think in the area of race and religion, we do not have that luxury. So in the area of work life harmony, things have been done to uh, appoint work life ambassador. And I'm just wondering, when will we see a, a diversity inclusion ambassador in the workplace that is equipped and trained to equip the entire organization about diversity and inclusion? I don't think we can afford another 20 years of wait like what we did for flexible work arrangement and work life harmony. So I'd just like your view on how can we expedite this process? Thank you. That's a good question about uh, ambassadors for diversity and inclusion, where we can wait for that. Over to you, sir. My name is Xavier Sami. I'm from Marymount IRCC. Well, uh, just now we had a very good discussion about, you know, uh, 
discrimination at work site and all that. To me, I think uh, meritocracy, we talk in Singapore meritocracy regardless of race, language, religion. In the top level, that is all well practiced, but only at the bottom side. This is what, I was also a unionist in the past, so I have seen all these things happening. Over the years, I think we have improved a lot. The, what you call the discrimination at the lower rung. I'm sure this is what's happening. We have not, we have progressed very well over the years. You can see the statistics which I've shown, but we can't get a zero percentage of that. So we are talking about the discrimination is still going on, but to a low, lower level, not only in the workplace, in every organization. You talk even the grassroots or whatever it is. So I think it is time. It's not enough we are doing. We, have, we should carry on progressively educating the people to make sure that the level goes down. You are right what Minister just now you mentioned about not only in Singapore we face this. It's all over the world. But in Singapore, we have a very good government that is going day by day doing look to the bottom of everything. I believe that in time to come, these figures will still go down further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those two, that comment and, and the other question. I've been asked to just remind everybody that based on our current requirements, you should be keeping your mask on if you're not asking questions. So in case you have your mask down, would you put it back on again? All right, thank you very much. Uh, SM has any thoughts on those two questions? Uh, let me tackle the first one about um, how do we expedite this culture shift among the, in the workplace and whether the idea of a diversity or inclusion ambassador as the term goes would really achieve the intended effect. In fact, when we talk about um, race and religion in the workplace, a lot of it's got to do not just about whether there is one particular ambassador that's advocating it. It's got to be everyone in the workplace needs to have that awareness. So first of all, the companies must have the understanding that they have the responsibility to create that inclusive workplace. But it also takes the responsibility of each and every employee, each and every colleague that you have, to be culturally attuned and to be aware and to exercise sensitivity as well. So it goes beyond just the role of having that one person um, preaching. So it's not just in form, but how do we as a society, as a, as a, you know, as a country, embrace that and call out any of these uh, bad practices that may happen. Now, so in talking about uh, creating, you know, enshrining the TGFEP into law, we are looking at also whether we need to specify some of these grievance handling processes that companies ought to have so that it empowers people who see certain things that are not good being done in a company, some bad practices, they feel empowered to be able to speak up or whistleblow. We may have to think about how to protect the whistleblower as well, so that anyone who may be a third party seeing something bad happening to someone else, a colleague, for example, who may not want to report it, but the whistleblower must feel empowered to speak up, so that there is you know, a collective effort to do this. Um, the flip side of saying that there's, it's the job of one inclusion ambassador means that everyone uh, say this is your job, not my job. I, I don't have to speak up because it's someone else's who should do it. So there are some wins and losses if you go on that approach, but by putting it onto the responsibility of everyone else, I think that empowers everyone to be the ambassador. It is not the job of one person. So, so I think what we want is to signal that it is our collective responsibility to do so. And hopefully the legislation provides a fair framework so that everyone is clear what is uh, the protection offered, so you're empowered to do so. Uh, Xavier's point about meritocracy, I think, is a good one. I think this, as you said, we may never get to zero, and I think no country has ever gotten to zero in this aspect before. So it will continue to be something that collectively we have to strive for, which is why we're here today talking about this. And the more we discuss and the more we raise awareness, I think there's a better shot at us reaching the end goal. Some, and some of these things do evolve over time. So it is not a static process in which you talk about it today and you think that it's cast in stone. It will solve the problem for the longer term. It has to be a conversation that we have to keep going uh, again and again. But as you said, we have made good strides over the last decades, and this is something that we should all be proud of, but not something we should rest our laurels on. Thank you. Thanks, SMS. 
Well, let me just see, see if there are other questions here. Yeah, if you can just get to the mic, if you don't mind, there's one there. There's also a okay. participant asking. We'll, we'll collect a few questions, and I'd like to group some things together. Uh, great. If you, so if you can get to the mic there, and uh, yeah, you just go ahead, please. Okay. Hi, morning. I'm Isia from Madlis Pusat, Singapore. Um, actually, when I stand, I've already prepared something to show that, that there's discrimination here. When I saw that the mic are so tall, and I'm so short, but very fast, the staff came and adjust the mic for me. Okay, this is something relevant to our life now, where when something happened that shows somebody who came up and assist without asking. Okay, that is not my question. <laughs> okay, I'm look, I'm, I've listened to Pete just now talking about TAPIF uh, rules, okay? And I also heard about, it is at the level of a human resource officer or maybe the manager who maybe the way they communicated with the applicant for new job, for, for, for new assignment, whatsoever, that maybe makes somebody feel that uh, they are being discriminated. So uh, just a suggestion. Will TAPE play a much bigger role in becoming a middleman to do the interviewing or filtering uh, candidates for new jobs. Because there's a possibility that the form that we apply for a job are being filtered until not even able to reach the HR, already being put aside. Maybe, I'm not sure, I'm not working. I'm a full-time housewife. Uh, Sometimes also my husband discriminate me, okay? <laughs> Okay, just uh, just a suggestion. Perhaps uh, Tapeps can do better. Can can do that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that that thought about. <laughs> Those very lively comments. But yeah, I think the whole issue about are there ways that we can enforce screening uh, or deal with people's attempts to screen very early in the process, which biases some people. Go ahead, sir. Okay, hi, Dr. Ko. I'm Brian Tan from Center for Fathering. Um, I think we can all agree that it's more empowering to re reinforce um, positive behaviour than to penalise uh, bad behaviour. So to mitigate against an overly litigious uh, culture, what are the existing platforms or what platforms do you think would be uh, useful moving forward that could highlight organisations with really great processes, policies and how could we uh, as the people here, uh, co-create them with you. Thank you. Great, I think two good questions, especially about highlighting uh, good practices. SMS, your thoughts? Yeah, thanks. Um, now, the suggestion about TAFAP doing filtering for job applicants. Um, not, not so, I think SMS, is, she's mentioning about processes in, in workplaces where the people are actually already filter because of forms. So you're saying is there some way that TAFAC can intervene to stop some of those practices yeah. so people don't do so that it's kind about of HR in the hiring, they filter out some That's of right, the yeah. attributes. So I think if you go upstream to preventing some of this filtration, um, first of all, I think we, we have to probably set some guidelines on what is appropriate in the application forms. Right? So for example, if the attribute that attri uh, application form asked for uh, is irrelevant to the job at all. So, for example, asking about height, right? Uh, <laughs> does the job need you to be so tall? And if not, then why is asking about height? Or is the job only a certain gender can perform? If not, asking about gender is irrelevant, for example, right? So, at the application process, at the way in which the application forms are designed, it could well be such that certain attributes that are not required for that job should not be attributes that the employer asks for. So there's no way they can then filter out based on those attributes. And that can be a way to make sure there is some form of fair scrutiny on the ability of that person rather than a priori already filter out the person based on age, race or gender. Right? So I think that, but you must understand it's a complex process because 
there are many, many different kinds of jobs out there with different job scopes and skills requirements. So it's very hard to do a one-size-fits-all kind of job application form. But the tripartite partners usually put out guidance. And the guidance and the principle behind which we want people to hire fairly is to make sure that this idea of having attributes that are only relevant to the jobs being put on the forms, especially during the advertising stage. And then in the interviews, uh, whether you should allow people to ask questions that are irrelevant as well. I mean, why should asking whether someone intends to get pregnant in the next two years or three years be relevant to whether the person can perform that job? So some of these attributes may well be protected attributes that actually in the hiring process should not be asked, and then that helps to prevent some of these uh, you know, conscious efforts to filter. But clearly, Tafet cannot be the one doing the filtration of the forms for all the 200,000 companies in Singapore and the 5 million people applying for jobs. It will not be possible because Tafet will not know what the job requirements for each role is. But we need to have a place, a process in which those who feel that they are disadvantaged or aggrieved by the hiring process and they felt it's discriminatory to be able to surface up for review. And then Tafet will go in and examine whether that process is unfair or discriminatory. And if so, take the employer or the hirer, hirer to task. So I think that's how the process will envisage to protect people who are job seekers. Um, I think Brian's suggestion is a good one on highlighting progressive companies with good practices. And in fact, today, there are many, um, you know, some of these award ceremonies that honors good employers, right? So, so that they are like, those are enterprises that are highlighted through many of these corporate events that showcase good hiring practices. Uh, but also, I think it works the other way to also highlight companies that are also undesirably uh, in practicing discrimination. So things like our fair consideration framework, in which there are companies who are listed as weak in their hiring processes, would also serve to give notice to companies that ought to pull up their socks a little bit and also send a signal to the rest of the employers that they have to abide by the fair, uh, fair hiring practices. So I think it, it cuts both ways, but I think there are mechanisms available today to do so. Thank you, SMS. I think there's a question there, and uh, if you have other questions, you're welcome to get to the mic. Yeah, if you, so if you can just get to the mic there. Or, yeah, please go ahead. Hello, good morning. My name is Joey Gan. I'm from uh, Maximus Asia Private Limited. Um, we currently work with uh, WSG to help um, PMAT workers above 40 years old uh, to get matched to jobs. And we also work with the Health Promotion Board uh, to provide some mental health nutrition workshops for the workforces. So our company is very focused on empowering the workforces. So personally, I have also worked in an MNC where we had a DNI and um, department. But I realized that in, our, in my current job, reaching out to some of these SMEs, a lot of the um, corporates uh, they have a very lean HR or, or admin uh, department. And one of the challenges, they have to look into hiring, they have to do admin, they have to do finance. And on top of that, there's always new policies coming up which need them to interpret. So I do see the uh, efforts by TAFED uh, and our ministry and even uh, WSH, the work Place Safety and Health Council. They've been trying very hard, but I think one feedback, maybe we could look at uh, accessibility of information, interpretation of in information in a more uh, convenient way. Perhaps rather than just a hotline or website that could be localized at different sites. Because just like uh, I mean, I'm learning from the HBB uh, physical workshops, for example. They go local at, uh, at the malls, at uh, you know, certain large um, uh, JTC sites, for example, you know, at the workplaces as, as a convenient way for maybe admin or HR managers during lunchtime to go to some of these booths, for example, you know, and then they can un ask questions or share practices uh, about what they have learned about certain policies. So uh, thank you for uh, listening to me. Thank you, Joey. 
think there's one more question. If, uh, so you can just go ahead. Oh, this is raising it for me. Thank you. <laughs> Morning, uh, SMS Dr. Ko. Hi, Benji. Uh, this is Benji from Singapore Association for the Visually Handicapped. Uh, obviously, the question I'm going to ask is regarding our uh, PWD, people with disability. In the application form, employer require the applicant to state that whether they are suffering from any disability or any other condition, I think this practice is rather discriminatory. Um, I hope Tafet can look into this, that can this be removed? Because by saying that my client is visually handicapped, oh, you cannot see, therefore you cannot work. I, I'm sorry, we have all the abilities that every one of us have, except they need reading devices. So this is a discriminatory practice. Second, our blind buskers have to compete with the sighted buskers and foreign buskers for performing in public places. Again, this practice is rather discriminatory because you require our buskers to go online to apply. Now, if their vision is impacted, how are they going to read the online application? Traditionally, it is paper application, but because of the digitization, NAC say everything go online. But we, we can play our part to assist our client to apply online for their license to public in play, public places, but they have to compete with the sighted buskers and foreign buskers and students' buskers. Our buskers do busking for a living. They don't do it as a hobby. So I hope uh, through SMS can appeal to NAC to look into whether our blind buskers can be given a separate permit as a handicap permit for buskers rather than we compete with the sighted buskers. Thank you. Uh, Benji, can I just ask, uh, how, how do they apply on the physical form? Previously, you just fill the form and then submit any. They fill themselves or someone help them fill? Uh, either someone help them fill or if they have low vision, they can still uh, write. But if it's complete online, they have to go navigate through the website and all that stuff. So we can apply our part to assist them to apply. But as a whole, if we want to encourage busking as a form of livelihood for our blind buskers, I think we should make it simplified because they are disadvantaged in competing with the sighted buskers. Thank you. Thanks, Benji. I think that the, the question is about how can we enable pe people with disability to continue to have fair access to employment opportunities and, um, and make sure that some of the process of doing so is not a barrier. I would imagine that whether it is a physical form they have to fill or a website they have to key things in, uh, the visually challenged will continue to face challenges. They either have to ask someone to fill the physical form for them or to actually go and access the website for them. So I think, I'm not sure whether the making it into a physical form instead of online will make it any easier for visually handicapped or visually challenged uh, job seekers, actually. I think we have to look at how we can put in place process for them to seek help when they need to. And at the end of the day, when the evaluation comes, it must be fair to them, right? Um, your question about whether uh, any form of job application form should specify whether there's a, a, a certain particular handicap. I suppose it's, um, it depends on whether the job requirements uh, need the person to be uh, able-bodied. So, for example, if you need someone to work at heights, uh, I think it will be quite challenging to not, at the point of application, make sure the person is able to climb up and down safely and can keep himself safe. Uh, so I think there are certain job requirements that require a physically uh, fit person to do so. Uh, but if that job is, say, just uh, uh, answering, say, for example, queries on the phone, then specifying whether the person is visually handicapped or not really has no relevance because it's answering a phone. Someone can be a core operator with or without vision. And I think that is something in which um, it has to be specific to the job at all. So I wouldn't say that every requirement listed about physical fitness or ability is discriminatory. If you are looking at hiring a, a soldier, you're looking at getting a security guard uh, who may need to go up and down, hiring a welder, I think there are certain attributes physically that is required. So not all requirements of a statement about physical fitness uh, can be, need to be deemed as discriminatory. So I think we've got to be quite careful about having a very simplified but uh, a one-stroke approach across all entire job scopes and spectrums. Um, Joey's point about um, how do we help small companies who does not have 
whole entire HR team or strategic HR team to be able to make sure they put in place uh, fair measures in the workplace and handle grievances uh, is an important one because, as, as she pointed out correctly, SMEs may have quite a lean manpower profile and sometimes the boss himself is both the CEO and the HR manager and the payroll manager and also at times the cleaner as well in the company office, right? So, so it is quite tough to then put too much effort to say that they have to have the full suite of services that the MNC would have. But I think when we, even if we enshrine some of these uh, guidelines into law, we are not trying to say that the company then has to grow an entire new HR department. And which is why my point of earlier about the fact that in any form of grievance handling or disputes about uh, fair hiring, we want mediation to be the first port of call. Because actually on our experience and, and TAFEF's experience is that a lot of these SMEs actually may have committed a discriminatory act without realising they have done so. Uh, simply because they have limited bandwidth to always be reading your websites or even if you put a booth, can you imagine the boss who's already doing three jobs, huh? cleaner plus HR manager plus CEO plus uh, uh, finance manager. I don't think he has the time to even walk around the mall and attend the booths when they are there. Right? So, so I think that there are genuine challenges. But by having mediation as the first port of call for any uh, grievance or disputes, it allows the third party to then take that mediation process as an educational process. Through that mediation process, the boss realised that this is wrong. And then he realised that these are the things that he needs to do. And so the mediation process itself serves as an educational opportunity. And our experience has shown that many of these companies, once they've gone through a particular mediation episode, they actually learn from it, and actually they don't necessarily re-offend again, because they realise that they have uh, to do some things to put in place processes. Of course, if they are egregious ones that keep repeating itself, TAFET will know what to do. Right? And clearly, in an SME setting where the number of employees are small, uh, it will set a very bad precedence and a very bad culture. And actually, word gets around in that, in that small work phase in the office. Most of the other employees will know that this boss has been unfair or someone has been treated unfairly. And it will be very difficult for this company to continue to hire new talent. So I think there are some natural friction in this process for companies to want to put in place uh, good practices. And we will try and see how best we can put out some of this information through different channels and work with stakeholders as well, through trade associations, through public uh, uh, talks, through brochures, even through online resources, to try and reach out to as many of these companies as possible. And those who cannot get any of this information, if they step on a landmine and end up with TAFEP, mediation hopefully will be a, a way to level them up again. Yeah, so I think that's why we say mediation and education is an important avenue to make sure we don't end up always going to legislation. But if mediation doesn't work, then legislation going to a court will be one of the last resort for both parties to then seek redress and get clarity and adjudicate on the outcomes for their dispute. Uh, SMS, if I can just press you on the earlier answer you had with, uh, when you were responding to Benji uh, in terms of reasonable criteria, and you mentioned about height, for instance. Uh, would, would you say, and I think many people would want to ask in the room, and perhaps because it was part of our survey as well, what about the Mandarin speaking criteria? So if the statement is our company, most of us prefer to speak in Mandarin, and that becomes a criteria, would you say that would be reasonable or would it be problematic? Again, I think the principle we want to go with is whether this is a genuine job requirement. Uh, there are certain jobs in which speaking Mandarin is a requirement. So for example, if you're hiring a sales manager for a China market, then you may well have to specify Mandarin speaking as a criteria. But it doesn't need to specify Chinese as a criteria, because I could well have an Indian or a Malay or a Eurasian who speaks Mandarin. So if you're hiring based on language ability because the job requires that, that is not discriminatory. But if you hire by race for a job that only requires a language competency, then that is potentially discriminatory. Yeah, I think that there's a difference in there. I hope you understand the, the nuances. Thank you very much, SMS. Others, yeah, please go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Nick Cheong from Marine Parade. Um, IRCC. Ageism may not necessarily be a bad thing. You know, I deliberately did not dye my hair because I take the MRT quite a lot. When I appear wobbly, a bit unsteady, you know, the young gentleman, young lady will automatically uh, give up their seats for me. 
And then if I need to uh, speak to younger audiences, ah, then that's the time to dye my hair. Um, I want to offer a perspective and also maybe ask a question. So, um, earlier we had two wonderful uh, panelists, Victor, uh, who spoke about um, recognizing that we are all imperfect human beings, that we all have biases. So I think the first thing we need to recognize is we name the sin, right? We, we, we practice discrimination, but having recognized that, so how do we deal with it? So we had a lady, young lady, um, just now from the floor. I think she was from Microsoft, jo Joanne, right? She talked about allyship. I think allyship is a very, very uh, powerful concept. And obviously, you can start from the top, but also in our own, in our own role. If we ask ourselves, what can we do to make a minority feel welcome? And a minority can be, you know, visually impaired, can be uncle whose hair is gray, can be Muslim during the fasting month. I, I've got two experiences to share. So the first experience is when I was doing a due diligence a HR, HR, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and I was very heartened to see that, um, you know, they had a small pantry, but what they did was that they, they had, um, you know, all these uh, packets of dried figs, uh, you know, and put in the pantry. It's a small gesture that goes a long way, right? Now, the other thing is, uh, this, this, this is an American example where you have a janitor, but within the limited role of a janitor, she was given some autonomy to talk to patients, and that made all the difference. So in the mundane day-to-day, -day, she found meaning. Now, the, 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 the ask that I want to have uh, is perhaps the government can take the first step uh, with regard to the, your, um, the application form. A couple of years ago, I applied to I cannot name the poly for obvious reasons, right? I applied to be a young lecturer, and then I told my wife, dear, in this application form, they're asking me to put in your name, your mobile phone, and whatnot. And I said, am I applying to be a PR in New Zealand, or am I applying for a job? Right, so I think what, maybe what we can do, we, I think we've heard from the feedback from, uh, from the floor, the, the, um, there should be a best practice form, and maybe TAFEP can do, that you only require information to fulfill the job role. Right? Just, and then whatever other information you need, yeah, you can, you can put it in. And, um, you know, perhaps it's time for um, the ministries, right, to revisit all your HR, you know, application forms. And I can understand that it's not that they don't want to do it, is that very leche la, to redesign the form, right? Correct not? I mean, you ask HR to redesign the form, to tell you, I've got so many things to do. Right? So, but, but, but it's important, you've heard from everybody, right? We, how can we do our part to you know, be more inclusive? It's the how-to that, that, that needs a bit thinking. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. I'll just quickly address your question is about um, what are the attributes that you should not be listed on a form because that could then promote discrimination. I think the tripartite work group looking at this, the committee is actually quite mindful of that. So they are looking and consulting widely and trying to land on what are the attributes that needs to be protected so that they cannot be even listed in a form or be asked during an interview. Right? So I think as we continue to consult some of these views that you have, we will take that into account. And it's not just about government forms or, or hiring practice. In this guidelines and this practice will have to be observed by every hiring organisation. Right? So I think this is something that we want to send a signal across. Yeah? Thanks so much for your views. Yeah, and please go ahead. Next question. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Uh, I'm Fazl Rahman. Uh, well, I'm here as Chairman of RCC of Kembangan Chai Chi. 
often SMS to Dr. Ko. Earlier on, I think during the panel session, I think one of the participants I think mentioned about inclusivity in schools. Please allow me just to share from the perspective of, although we're talking about fair employment, uh, we're looking at international schools in Singapore. Singapore will always be an open society welcoming everyone. And we've seen trends of transmigration, Singaporeans and foreigners coming in, in and out. We're also seeing increasing numbers of international schools in Singapore. I'm talking about two aspects. First, I'm looking at employment. Whether do we have opportunities for more Singaporean teachers, educators to participate? More opportunities, sorry, say that again. More opportunities for employment of Singaporean teachers in, in the, the international, international schools. schools. Well, there, there are two aspects. One are the fully fledged international schools. And of course, we have three of our local affiliated ACS International, SGI International, and Huachong International. At the employment stage, I think we have seen how the government has come in looking at certain sectors, especially financial industry, we talk about foreigners versus Singaporeans, employment opportunities. But if we look at the increasing trend of international schools in Singapore, whether the government will also actually come in to see how we can actually get more of our Singaporean teachers to have the opportunity. Because sometimes the, single, the international school says, no, you need to have international experience. Uh, well, to put it into context, my wife is in one of the schools because we were in Qatar before. So my wife and the kids, they, have, they did IB in Qatar. But we are seeing certain trend where the Singaporean core in these schools, in terms of where active employment, promotion, and in senior management, Because that leads to the other part in terms of where we're talking about inclusivity. Because even for us in RCC, we are doing a very fresh uh, work group this year because of the 20th anniversary. We're talking about inclusivity, bringing in the foreigners, the clans associations, and even talking about the students themselves. So if we need more of our Singaporean educators within those institutions so that we're able to create a more inclusive environment, not just to wait when you decide to get employed in Singapore, because the issue of interaction that they have, I think this is the other part which I would like to touch upon, where in terms of interaction between the students, I still remember when uh, back in RI in 82, we started to have the exchange pro uh, immersion program, RI in Greenshoot with River Valley High, and then we also have now SEP schools, madrasas, but whether can we also have that an extension of further interaction with some international schools for the students? So I'm talking about two parts, employment with Singaporean educators, and the part more inclusive interaction between the foreigners and our Singaporean heartlanders. Thank you. No, no other questions? So I'll, yeah, there's, there's one yeah. more there, yeah. So just go ahead and speak. Good afternoon, Minister and Matthew. I'm Lastrina from Singapore Youth for Climate Action. So I volunteer in the environment space, but I'm also someone who is very interested in social causes. Um, so I'm, I have two questions um, that I'm asking because I don't think I've heard this being brought up uh, this session. Um, so the first part is that I think so far, uh, in terms of the things that we've seen, um, these are race-based workplace discrimination based on the lens of a Singaporean. Um, and on that Singaporean workforce core, I, I think one segment that we've not heard about is the platform workers or the gig workers. Um, and I just wanted to also get your insights in the, into the current consultation that is being done uh, with platform workers, specifically on making CPF mandatory, right? So on workplace fairness, uh, what kind of challenges or you know, insights you can share with us? What kind of challenges would uh, employee, employers have in also providing CPF contribution for their gig workers. Uh, so that's one. And the other part is in terms of the general Singapore workforce. Um, we're technically also looking at 1.2 million foreign workforce, and that's about a third of our workforce population. 
So on that, we have different segments, right? Like migrant workers, domestic workers, um, and mi migrant workers, there's various discriminatory issues. For domestic workers, we're also looking at cases of illegal employment or physical abuse. So I'm wondering, you know, from your perspective as a minister, what kind of systemic change needs to happen so that the Singapore core treats people from other countries fairly or better? Um, I'm not you know, going to ask about like, morals and whatnot, but from a systemic view, from the lens of a minister, right? what do you think needs to happen so that we all treat each other better? Yep, that's all. We're, we're kind of straying away from race and religion at work, but let, let me at least you try and address some of these questions that are asked. Um, now, more Singapore teachers in international schools, I think, uh, let, me, let me first state that any organisation that is Singapore-based, that means based in Singapore, would have to follow fair employment practices that we set up. Right? Now, international schools teach a different curriculum. They also have a different uh, way of approaching their interaction with students. So, if there is a genuine job requirement, for a teacher in an international school to be able to teach a different curriculum, to be able to understand the cultural and maybe some of the language challenges that some of the international students face, then there may well be a genuine need for a different recruitment profile of teachers to be able to serve the needs of their international students. Right? So it will be very hard to have the international school deliver on their curriculum uh, when the teachers that they're hiring has never taught uh, and never interacted with students with a certain uh, need as well. So I think that there is a genuine, if there's a genuine demand, I don't think that it's necessarily wrong for them to specify a certain attribute that they need to look for in the teacher. International schools also teach different languages, actually. They teach Spanish, they choose French as a, as a, as a language. They may not necessarily teach Mandarin, or some, some of them even offer Japanese. So I think you can, you can, you can realize that because their curriculum is different, uh, it, it will be very hard to specify they have to necessarily hire a Singaporean trained teacher to do so. But where there are possibilities for Singaporean trained teachers to meet certain requirements, so for example, if they're teaching a Chinese language course, teaching about Singapore history, surely there will be uh, a possibility for some of these Singaporean teachers to fill the, the ranks. So I think you cannot take that approach that uh, uh, is unfair hiring per se. Neither can we say that there has to be a certain quota of Singaporeans teaching in those schools because that would constrain the school to deliver on their mission. Uh, we also don't have the same quota in our Singaporean schools to say you must hire a certain quota of foreigner teachers for diversity because the foreigner teacher cannot actually teach some of the subjects that we want our students to learn as well because they are not trained in NIE, they are not necessarily trained in the pedagogy of uh, the methods of teaching certain subjects in Singapore. So I think it, it cuts both ways. Right? So I thought this is just uh, my simplistic view of how uh, in that sector looking about, because I'm not in the Ministry of Education, by the way. Now, uh, Sridhar's question is also uh, kind of a little bit straying off from the topic today. Gig workers is a different ecosystem altogether, and um, the work of the committee looking at the gig workers is really to make sure that as far as key areas that would protect them, whether it's the retirement adequacy, housing needs pertaining to CPF contribution, and whether it's the workplace injury with their, uh, uh, you know, because they do drive around or they run around and do get injured, how can we make sure that the protection given to these workers in times of injury, hopefully they are no, not severely worse off compared to any other working person in Singapore. So the committee is still really uh, discussing all the different stakeholders. We have not landed on the final position yet, but that's the thinking behind it, to make sure these workers are not left too far behind compared to the rest of Singaporean workforce. Your final question about how we can help Singaporeans to actually treat foreign workers in our midst better. Um, that may not necessarily be something that falls into the purview of legislation. It's got to do with how we see another fellow human being. It's got to do with our personal attitudes and what our own values are. So it's a complex issue. The law itself cannot solve this problem if we, in our mind, want to discriminate somebody and look at the person as different from us. Uh, the law can signal certain positions, but at the end of the day, uh, I don't think Singaporeans are necessarily all looking at discriminating foreign workers. You can see that some of the um, things that Singaporeans have stepped up to do during COVID crisis when the workers themselves uh, needed help. There's no shortage of people who contribute resources, money, time, and even volunteering uh, in our dorms to really take care of the workers. 
So I think these are good steps for us to do as a society. And as we continue to emerge from this crisis, how can we help Singaporeans to see that this is also part of our social construct to embrace these workers and help them to integrate into our living environment? I think that's going to be continuous work in progress. Thank you, SMS, and thanks for indulging us in a couple of questions. Just want to remind us, we don't have a lot of time, so if you can just focus your question, uh, so keep it short, and could you focus on race and religion in the workplace? That would be great uh, for this setting. So I'd like to take, I just want to make sure that that's the questions that we have uh, available. All right, okay, we've got one there. Yeah, hi, my name is Elvin from Faith Music Centre. So we are a training centre for persons with disability and elderly. I just thought I'd like to bring an incident uh, at my workplace recently. One of my colleagues who is uh, hearing impaired, she has a cochlear implant. She, we actually sent her for an upgrading course. And then uh, it was held in Zoom. So they didn't want to give her the, the captioning part, which makes it very difficult for her to learn. And then uh, during the, the course and the training itself, she was also said, hey, you are in a blind spot because she can't seem to be able to hear what the... So she even cried about it. So I think it was, it quite, it, it caused such an impact in my company that we were so, a lot of our, my other colleagues who are persons with disability, they dare not go into training. Yeah, then at the, at the same time, also, the trainer even said that perhaps she should reconsider her choice of career because being uh, hearing impaired. So, uh, so this is something that I became a concern not just for, because I'm sure a lot of companies also hire persons with disability and would like to send them for uh, upgrading courses. So I was thinking, uh, would uh, anything be done to, to train the trainers, equip them with this ability so that they can also um, train persons with disability and elderly so that they can uh, in their, be better in their workplace? Thank you. Thanks. And then there's also another question here. I hope it's on race and religion. In yeah, 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 it is. Um, so to steer the conversation back to race and religion. Um, yeah, so um, my name is JC and I am uh, part of uh, the Okay, uh, OP Man, which is an initiative by One People SG. So we are like a youth um, debate conference of sorts uh, that uh, debates on local issues. Yeah. Um, so my question would uh, actually be pertaining to one of the statistics that has shown up uh, during the, sh the sharing by uh, Dr. Matthew Matthews, and I think it kind of uh, pertains to the conversation here as well. So um, there was a statistic saying that about uh, only about like slightly less than 50% of uh, Singaporeans actually do believe that uh, by discriminating and uh, choosing uh, basically uh, hiring people uh, based on uh, purely the distinguishing factor of race uh, is actually a, not a very justified thing to do. Uh, it shows that there's actually a large amount of Singaporeans that do still believe to some extent that uh, discriminatory hiring practices is okay. So uh, given that uh, hopefully the statistics has actually uh, encapsulated a more diverse sample size. That means that people within the recruitment uh, hiring practices uh, and essentially all of the, how to say, people who are um, involved in uh, recruitment in Singapore and uh, critically uh, helping, I, I guess like within HR like, essentially, uh, are part of this statistic. So. Uh, my question would be, um, in that case, we have already uh, established, I guess, like explicit, explicit biases such as like with um, aesthetic attributes, for example, as you guys have said, uh, within uh, their um, forms to see whether or not uh, they have actually, how do I say, uh, actually um, fit a certain, how do I say, they, I mean, non-discriminatory, uh, practices based on like um, attributes within your forms. So in that case, right, uh, there is still like, as we know, implicit biases that may exist. And uh, as a person who uh, currently works within uh, a company that actually creates um, HR solutions uh, for um, basically professionals in the working field, um, 
I do kind of want to know how do we as a society address this kind of like implicit discrimination uh, that may exist during the hiring practices, for example, so that we can actually uh, improve on uh, our hiring practices and ensure that it's pragmatic, first of all, and second of all, uh, ensure that there's like good DNI uh, hygiene for the lack of better term. Thank you. Over to you, SMS, if you have two questions. If. Yeah, so um, Elvin's question about how do we help more of the, those with disability, I think that, that one will have to be an ongoing conversation uh, between equipping you know, HR managers or even companies who may have the desire to hire uh, people with disability, how can we equip them with the ability to understand what they need to do in terms of either redesigning the job or putting in place measures in the workplace and even educating some of the colleagues that this person may have to work with so that everybody is more aware of how they can be an enabler. Right? So some of it has got to do with uh, uh, introducing people to the understanding so that they are comfortable working with alongside people with some disability. We are looking at a work stream, uh, a work group to look at this and see how best we can make some workplaces much more inclusive, uh, including people with physical disability and perhaps even looking at those with some uh, mental illnesses as well. Because those with mental illness may not necessarily be something that is uh, constantly ill. They, they could have episodes of relapse, but they could well have many, many years of actually very functional ability to contribute positively to the workforce. So it is a complex space because we have to actually get past some of this stigmatization. We also need to equip employers and, and fellow colleagues with the knowledge, but it is a work in progress and we'll continue to work with stakeholders, especially those who are involved in uh, helping these particular disadvantaged groups to make workplace more conducive. Um, the statistics that we talk about, about people being also maybe sometimes a bit more racially aware, but actually, one of the surveys we did, um, I think the MOM's uh, Fair Employment Survey also showed, kind of encouragingly actually, that over the period from 2018 to 2021, um, race as a reported discriminatory attribute has actually dropped from about maybe 11% or so of job seekers to about 5.3% of job seekers. Right? So, but these are the reported discriminatory episodes for which a certain job seeker actually felt that there was a, indeed an, ex, an episode that he feels that he has to report and to seek redress. Of course, there is a difference between what is reported versus what is perceived. Usually the perception may be a higher number than what actually is reported because um, when you ask people about whether you perceive there is, most people, it's, it's easier to imagine that there is a perception of discrimination. But in actual fact, they may or may not actually have encountered it. Right, so I think the answer probably lies somewhere in between the numbers because even reporting, they could well be under-reporting as well. So it's probably not as high as 50, 60 percent all discriminated, neither is it probably as low as 5 percent uh, of reported things, so it's probably somewhere in between. Right? Again, that highlights the fact that we have to continue to work at this and bring it as low as possible. Uh, some of the measures which we said earlier about protecting certain attributes from being uh, disclosed or discovered during the initial hiring process could actually help to reduce some of these incidences and putting in place grievance handling and redress measures and maybe some remedial uh, avenues when the job seeker makes uh, a complaint to TAFAC, for example, would help to send a stronger signal to hiring agencies and, and companies and also to then make sure that those who are aggrieved get proper redress. And over time, hopefully, society will then find a new water level and say, look, this is something that we all agree and we'll all speak up against. Yeah. Thank you. I do think we are running out of time. In fact, we're supposed to conclude, though I do notice that. So nobody <coughs> else. Great. Well, and, uh, yeah, we'll just take one more last question and then, uh, were you asking a question? No. No, okay. Please go ahead and, uh, were you, Okay, you, you're waiting for a question. All right, so let's just take that two final questions and then we'll conclude. So first, maybe if you can just keep it very short, that will help us as we conclude. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Jia Yi. I'm representing one people.sg, uh, like JC. So I would like to add on like uh, what she mentioned about implicit biases. So my question is, uh, implicit biases, they sort of exist inherently and they're really difficult to get rid of. But at the same time, we encourage like inclusive and tolerant workplaces. So... 
uh, would you say that it's all right for people to still hold implicit biases as long as they try to control it and like uh, try to you know get rid of these biases and uh, make the workplaces a safe space no matter what their like most underlying beliefs are thank you thank you and over to you uh, hi i'm pauline from uh, southwest cdc i'm also a hr practitioner so what's happening is i'm not exactly sure that we should be actually um, filling up the form the very detailed application form at the point of uh, shortlisting and interviewing i mean for for where i'm coming from usually we will only get the applicant or the shortlisted applicant whom we are going to hire to fill up the form. That's at the last stage. So it's not at the first stage. So we do not really need so much information, I think, at the initial stage. So I'm not sure if uh, that, that will help uh, you know, in uh, lessening the biasness when you look at the form or the very detailed form. But of course, I think in the government sector, likely the form are very, very detailed. I'm not very sure. <laughs> If you know, uh, you know, y'all can we assess that? Uh, I mean, over time to make sure that, you know, you just need the necessary information, and maybe as I said in the initial stage, you know, don't bother with the form because you just shortlist the applicant, you talk to the applicant to have to to understand the ability on the job, rather than you know to to sort of judge the applicant based on all the detailed information on race, on age. Yeah, and, and the other stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, your, your, your HR practice is quite progressive, uh, but <laughs> government jobs are different because there is a security element. So sometimes the information is required for security screening as well, right? Because depending on the level of job you're applying for and the role that you're supposed to do, there has to be a thorough security screening of uh, a government uh, officer. So, so that's why some of the details are a lot more, uh, you know, upfront, right? Okay, but again, like I say, we will always review some of our practices to make sure that we adhere to the spirit of the fair hiring protect, uh, practices in Singapore as well. Um, implicit biases, I think, as the word says, is implicit. It's something that is in our subconscious or maybe even deep inside. Even in societies that are very open, um, some of these implicit biases exist as well. They may not say it to your face, but they do have some of these implicit biases, and that's part and parcel of being human, unfortunately. And I don't think uh, any form of legislation, any schemes, any actions on the part of external party can so easily change some of these implicit biases. Over time, as our own lived experience starts to change, we may also change our biases and become a lot more fair and open. But it is something that I think is very hard from an external perspective to, to really reprogram and rewire the, the mind and the brain and then say, you know, just because we say so, everybody starts to think and live in a certain way, um, which is why all of us here have our work cut out for us to continue to shape the perception and to make sure as far as possible, we call out biases, we call out bad practices, and then help each other to move that one extra step ahead to be more inclusive and to be more fair in the way we treat other people. Thank you, as much for mentioning that, especially since One People, IPS, and many of the community organizations here, uh, we're doing what we can and we want to continue to work to challenge some of those implicit biases so that we can see the kind of workplace and society which is a lot more harmonious. Uh, with that, I, we have really benefited from SMS's very candid discussion and also willingness to look at a whole array of issues in the workplace. So could you join me now and just thank SMS for his thank you, everyone. sharing his thoughts.